Good morning, everybody. I am Luiz Augusto de Castro Neves, president of the Brazil-China Business Council, and I'm glad to be able to welcome all of you to the CBC Summit webinar, U.S.-China Rivalry and its Impact on Brazil. Uh, this event is made possible thanks to our sponsor, sponsor the bank Itaú BBA. You can follow your CBC in our social media channels on Twitter and LinkedIn and YouTube. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce our keynote speaker today, which is Ambassador Thomas Shannon, a career ambassador. Tom Shannon spent nearly 35 years in the U.S. Foreign Service and working under six presidents and 11 secretaries of state. When he retired in 2018, he was under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, the third highest ranking position at the Department of State. Tom Shannon was also U.S. Ambassador to Brazil from 2010 to 2013. And currently, he is a senior international policy advisor at Arnold and Porter, one of the largest law firms in the world. The moderator is one of the most distinguished Brazilian diplomats, Ambassador Sérgio Amaral. Sérgio was Brazilian ambassador to the US, to Britain, and France. A career diplomat, he was also Minister of Industry and Commerce and spokesperson of the president during the Fernando Henrique Cardoso government. In the private sector, he presided the Brazil-China Business Council and was a member of the board of the World Wildlife Fund in Brazil, as well as French and Brazilian companies. Currently, Sergio is associated with the law firm Felsberg and Advogados and is a member of Fiesp Strategic Council. The idea is that Tom will speak for about 20 minutes. After that, Sergio will make comments and raise some questions. Uh, the last 20 minutes will be dedicated to questions from the audience. One can use the Q&A tool on Zoom and to send your questions. I wish you all a wonderful event and give the floor to Tom Shannon, which I'm very honored to do. Tom, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Castro Neves. Uh, what a great pleasure to be with you and to be with my dear friend, Ambassador Sergio Amaral. And at this event, uh, sponsored by the, the Brazil-China Business Council, uh, to talk about an issue that is hugely important for the United States, for China, and for Brazil, uh, which is how these three great nations and three great peoples relate to each other in the contemporary economic, political, and social environment uh, that we all face. And I'm looking forward to this discussion uh, and especially looking forward to the questions and comments from Ambassador Amaral, but also broadly from those participating. Uh, my purpose is to have a dialogue with all of you uh, to share my understandings, but also to understand better uh, your concerns and to see to what extent I can address them. Um, I thought it would be best to start by underscoring something that I'm sure you would all agree, which is that in many ways, the relationship between China and the United States is one of the defining relationships of the 21st century. In fact, maybe one of the most important defining relationships uh, in, in this century. But at the same time, it's not the only defining relationship. In fact, I would argue that Brazil's relationship with the United States and Brazil's relationship with China can also be identified as defining relationships, given Brazil's size, the importance of its democracy, the importance of its, uh, of its economy, uh, and the way that it has always projected itself into the world uh, beyond uh, its region and has always had a, a, a global ambition similar to the United States and, and similar to China. And so to understand how this triangular relationship functions and how best to manage it, uh, I, I think it's important to, to, to take a step back and try to understand first where the, the US-China relationship is. And I would refer everyone to the speeches just given at the virtual UN General Assembly by President Trump uh, and by the Chinese leader Xi. Uh, for those listening closely, uh, both speeches are a cause for concern and worry. 
because they highlight a large differences between these two countries and an increasing view on both sides uh, that uh, China is an adversary to the United States and from the Chinese point of view that the United States is an adversary to China. Uh, President Trump was quite blunt in the opening, uh, his opening comments in which he uh, said that China had to be held accountable uh, for uh, its handling of uh, the coronavirus issue in China, uh, blaming it for not engaging sufficiently uh, with the international community, not limiting flights, not sharing information, and laying the groundwork for the pandemic that was to come. Uh, but he also pointed a finger at Chinese environmental policies, at Chinese economic policies, uh, and made very clear uh, that the United States saw in China a power that needed, uh, if not to be contained, at least needed to be constrained in some fashion. While the Chinese leader Xi was more diplomatic in his language uh, and less aggressive in the way in which he identified the challenges facing China in the world, he made clear without naming the United States that uh, a attitude towards global affairs that understood global affairs in a zero sum fashion uh, was a mistake uh, and that major powers had to act like major powers, which meant that they had to accommodate uh, rising powers and that they had to find a way to expand and share uh, the common good or public goods. Um, this tension uh, between the two leaders is remarkable in many ways, but principally because President Trump began his presidency quite intent on shaping and forming a relationship with Xi Jinping, uh, which would be based on a, a personal relationship of confidence and trust and, and access, and that that relationship would be used to try to refashion aspects of the US-China relationship. Um, in this regard, it's important to, to note or, or to understand that um, at the beginning of the, the Trump administration, uh, US-China um, perceptions, um, especially in the United States, had reached a relatively positive place. Um, in 2017, uh, research uh, or polling done by the Pew Research Center showed that about 40% of Americans viewed China favorably and about 40% of Americans viewed China unfavorably. Most recently, um, a, a poll done by the same organization, the Pew Research Center, found that 60% of Americans view China unfavorably and um, only 26% view China favorably. In other words, in less than four years, there's been a dramatic shift in how Americans perceive China. And uh, part of this is the product of Chinese behavior. Part of it is related to American politics. Uh, and part of it has to do with how the United States and China are, are presenting themselves uh, globally. And if, um, if, if you look at, at these numbers, it's, it's, it's worth noting that uh, uh, at the beginning of this administration, President Trump attempted a, a different approach to China, as I noted, a personal approach in his engagement with the Chinese leader, but also trying to reshape the security aspect of the US-China relationship, moving it away from a point of conflict, with, which was the South China Sea, to a point of cooperation, which was North Korea. Um, that worked for a period of time. But with the North Korean uh, uh, talks between uh, the North Korean leader and President Trump, between our, our envoys and North Korean envoys stuck and not producing results, and with China effectively not being able to, to deliver uh, a North Korea deal for the United States, and then with the increasing economic uh, um, confrontation that has taken place between the United States and China, especially in the area of trade, uh, the relationships have soured over time. And it's important to note that in late 2018, uh, in a speech given at the Hudson Institute, Vice President Pence laid out a very different approach to China and said that while the United States had made a tremendous effort uh, to work positively with China, 
that China's behavior, uh, not only inside the United States, but outside the United States indicated uh, that it was prepared to um, challenge the United States and try to assert itself in a way that was harmful to, to US interests. And this began a steady deterioration in the bilateral relationship that has been reflected in how Americans understand China. But if you'll allow me to take just a moment and dig a little deeper into how Americans understand China, it's important to note that a majority of Americans think that a growing Chinese economy is good for the United States. They recognize that there are problems in the, in the economic relationship, um, probably most clearly signaled through the tariff battles and the trade battles between the two countries. Um, but uh, Americans, for the most part, understand uh, the economy and world trade not as a zero-sum game, but as one that expands over time in which all people can benefit. That's important because it actually creates a base from which we could construct a better US-China relationship. But where China gets low marks uh, from Americans is in uh, the increasing role of the Chinese military in its foreign affairs, in the militarization of the South China Sea, in the way in which uh, China has built military bases uh, in Djibouti uh, and is looking for ways to build a military presence uh, uh, in the Indian Ocean, um, and also the, the way in which uh, it behaves uh, industrially in terms of industrial espionage and its unwillingness to respect intellectual property rights. And especially in the United States, uh, what China has done in Hong Kong, not only in terms of uh, repressive legislation designed to control and, and shape uh, Hong Kong's political institutions, but also the way in which it uses technology uh, to assert social control, but also the way in which uh, China is treating Uyghur, uh, Uyghurs in Xinjiang pro province, which for many Americans reflects how China treated Tibet uh, and is, is deeply worrisome for, for many Americans. This kind of creates a, a kind of a set of issues, whether it be the rise of China's military, uh, the anti-American uh, tone of Chinese nationalism, uh, human rights issues, and then the way in which China lives up or does not live up to uh, international agreements uh, that has an effect on how Americans perceive China. Uh, what's important and striking to, to, to remember is that this has an impact internally in the United States <clears throat> and has an impact on the politics of the United States. And it's worth noting that if you look at um, uh, the way in which uh, President Trump is running his campaign uh, for president, China is a big part of it. Not only because he's using uh, China uh, as a way to deflect uh, blame uh, for how the US has handled the coronavirus and the pandemic, but also on economic issues and the need to have a strong government response uh, to, to China. Um, this is a, a and if you look deeper into the Republican Party, whether you're talking about Secretary Pompeo, whether you're talking about other potential uh, presidential candidates in 2024, from uh, former governor and ambassador to the UN, Nikki Haley, uh, to Senator Ted Cruz, to Senator Tom Cotton, to Senator Marco Rubio, a, a strong uh, anti-China platform is a big part of how they uh, uh, kind of promote their politics. Uh, and as such, we can expect that it's going to be a central part of how the Republican Party uh, addresses China. Interestingly enough, polling shows that in the Democratic Party, Russia is seen as a greater threat than China, but China is still viewed as a problem uh, and an adversary in waiting. Uh, and, and so in this regard, um, the, uh, there, there is, a, to a certain extent, a, a bipartisan uh, uh, support uh, both in the Congress and broadly in the United States for much of the actions that President Trump has taken uh, towards China. But what's interesting to note is that the Chinese have a way of influencing this uh, through their behavior and through the way in which they engage with the United States. Uh, and I'm not sure if the, China, if the Chinese fully understand that they, that they have agency in this process, that they can have an impact, but it's going to be important for them to um, uh, to understand this and to try to play a role. 
Um, I've talked about uh, what Americans think of China. I've talked about how the Trump administration has changed its approach to China uh, across the, the nearly four years of its, of its first presidency. And I've, I've touched briefly on um, how Republicans and Democrats uh, understand uh, China. So I, I think it's important to take a moment and talk a little bit about the elections in the United States now and what impact those elections could have uh, on the, the US-China relationship and what this might mean for Brazil. Uh, I noted that Republicans tend to view China uh, as a greater threat than Democrats, with Democrats putting Russia uh, above China, um, but also noting that there still is uh, a, an, an overwhelming majority in the United States that, that views China negatively. And this is gonna limit to a certain extent uh, what a, uh, a Biden presidency uh, might be able to do in regards to China. But where there would be a significant difference between a Biden presidency and a reelected uh, President Trump is in the way in which diplomacy is managed. Uh, President Trump and his administration has largely taken a unilateral approach uh, to China. Uh, I believe that uh, Democrats would prefer, prefer a more multilateral approach. Uh, and by that, I mean not only working it, through international institutions, um, but also working in concert uh, with allies and partners who share similar concerns uh, about China. Uh, and these obviously are countries uh, in our own hemisphere, Brazil among them, and our European trading partners who have significant trading relationships with China and looking for ways in which to use those trading relationships to influence how China behaves and how it relates to each other. And this brings me really to Brazil uh, because it's obvious that uh, China is Brazil's most important trading partner in, in terms of, of gross numbers. Um, the United States is probably Brazil's most important trading partner in terms of value added and connection to a 21st century economy and innovative technologies. Uh, but there's no doubt that both of these trading relationships are important to Brazil. And the, the, the trick for Brazilian diplomacy is going to be how to maintain those two relationships, get the most from them for Brazil without alienating uh, or, or angering or fundamentally um, uh, damaging the relationships with either Brazil and the United States. Uh, the government of President Bolsonaro has been very clear in its support uh, of the United States and the relationship between President Bolsonaro and President Trump. And President Bolsonaro in his UN speech um, was clear about how uh, Brazil was going to engage with countries that not only provided trade benefits, but also to a certain extent reflected the values uh, of Brazil. This was a quiet message of sort uh, to, to the Chinese. But uh, as, as Brazil looks into the world, and far be it from me to give advice uh, to Brazilian diplomats, um, they know how to do this well, and they have deep experience in this. But it's worth noting that um, one of the US approaches uh, to uh, China has been to try to ring it with democracies uh, and to work to strengthen our relationships with South Korea, with Japan, with Indonesia, with Australia and New Zealand, uh, and with India, uh, to ensure that no matter which way China turns, uh, it will always see a democracy that has a friendly relationship with, with the United States. And it's our purpose similarly um, in South America uh, to ensure that we have the positive relationships necessary so that when China is engaging uh, with important partners in South America, whether it be Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Peru, Colombia, um, that they are encountering countries that have strong relationships with the United States and carry with them their democracy and their free market approach to trade into their relationship uh, with China. But also in, in, in this regard, I, I think I would underscore the importance of building relationships across the Pacific and the importance of building relationships um, not only with uh, South Korea and Japan and, and the, the countries that immediately ring uh, uh, China, but especially Australia and New Zealand, who are going to be playing very important roles uh, in the South Pacific, which is one of the strategic areas of interest uh, of China. 
and could act as a very important balancing point as China pushes deeper into uh, Southeast Asia, into Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, and, and beyond. Um, I, I, I'm going to close my initial remarks uh, by, by noting that um, good diplomacy is about accommodation. Good diplomacy is about finding ways to ensure that the fundamental interests of countries are met without endangering one's own interests at the same time. Um, the United States and China have a big challenge in front of them as they look for ways to fashion their own relationship. Um, but how we relate to each other is gonna depend a lot on how our partners relate to us and to China. And in this regard, I believe that Brazil can play a very important role in helping the United States understand the importance of China in a globalized South America uh, and, and a South America in which the Chinese economy is not going to disappear or go away, uh, but, but that it can help China understand the importance of democracy, respect for human rights, respect for adherence to international agreements and rules and norms uh, as it engages in the world. Uh, and that uh, a, a very special commitment uh, to the environment, uh, to addressing climate change issues, and to addressing issues of corruption are going to be a fundamental part of how the countries beyond the U.S.-China rivalry um, rate and, and measure the activities of the United States and, and, and China as they engage in the world today. So why don't I, I stop there? Um, I, I, I want to underscore the fact that I believe that that the, the US-China relationship is not one destined for confrontation and conflict. Uh, I do not believe in the Thucydides trap uh, presented by Graham Allison. I believe that great nations can behave greatly uh, and even in a period of, of competition can find areas of cooperation and collaboration. Uh, and that Brazil, which is expert at that, has a role to play. So thank you very much. And Ambassador Amaral, I turn to you. Sergio, I think you're on mute. There you go. Yes, um, it is a real pleasure for me to listen to you and uh, to be together with you in this meeting. And uh, I think you made a very comprehensive presentation as usual. And I think you have already focused the main issues, some of them I had in mind to raise with you. But uh, before I start with my comments, I'd like to thank you very much for having accepted this invitation. I think uh, uh, I also thank C uh, the China Brazil Business Council for having hosted this this meeting to have included me. I'm very happy to be back to the council in very good company of Ambassador Shannon. And I'd like very much also to thank Itaú for its sponsorship of this event. This is not something new. I remember when I was the chairman of the China Brazil Business Council, Itaú. Uh, participate in some of the most important events we have organized and the loyalty of Itaú to this cause, which is to better understand relations with China together with the United States is a very important incentive to what we can do. I would like to, to start by just mentioning very quickly uh, what is inevitable, which was the, the speech by both presidents at the uh, General Assembly of the United Nations. And uh, I think that uh, uh, the, the, the speeches reflected the difference between the two countries or the two leaders on the issue of the bilateral relations, in which I think and from some time, China has been looking 
for a recognition of its emergency. Uh, and uh, it has been looking for the recognition of a special relationship between the two countries. When uh, uh, Xi Jinping visited uh, uh, President Obama, and I think it's uh, in 2015, this is a point he stressed, perhaps in a discreet way, that it's time for Brazil and the, uh, for not Brazil, for the US and China to have uh, a special relation, a special dialogue of two superpowers. And Obama has not reacted to this invitation. And since then, this is an open invitation which uh, has not had any uh, clear signal from the part of the United States. And I think that this is perhaps what is behind this, uh, uh, I, would, I would not say confrontation, but uh, uh, what is behind this tense relationship that the two countries have underwent and, uh, in, in recently, uh, in recent times, in recent years, mainly in the uh, months uh, which have uh, uh, been the spectacle or the confrontation of different uh, uh, steps taken by both sides. I fully agree with you, Tom, that uh, uh, the, the United States has good arguments uh, not to fully accept uh, many of China uh, measures and initiatives on the political side. But I also think that uh, there was a difference, <clears throat> and you pointed out the Vice President Pence's speech at the Hudson Institute, but there is also a change in the nature of uh, the uh, United States uh, policies, which perhaps goes beyond the uh, good arguments that you have given and perhaps uh, put at stake this emergence of China or uh, uh, go beyond trade, go beyond technology and have to do with the, the, the reluctance of the United States perhaps to accept the emergence of China. I think that the question is just behind is will the United States in case uh, China uh, follow the rules uh, in case China give up some of its uh, infringements or some of its uh, uh, policies that uh, have been appointed by you, would the United States society be prepared to recognize China as a peer, as an equal? I think that more, more recently, you had two uh, different approaches in US policies to China, which would not help. The first was President Trump concern with the impact and repercussion of uh, his policies, his sanctions on the electoral debate. And the second was clearly the radicalization of uh, Secretary of State Pompeo, which insists on reminding us that uh, China and the United States are already in a Cold War a situation, which legitimizes some of the sanctions uh, which have been adopted by uh, the United States more recently. This kind of approach, I think, uh, may remain after the elections. In case Trump wins, will he try to accommodate, as you mentioned, the, the, the relationship uh, with China, or will he double down? Yeah. Is he prepared to reduce uh, the tension between the two countries by a reduction, and even in some case, the elimination of sanctions. I, I, I think it's very interesting to realize 
that uh, uh, the two countries tend to adopt different approaches with respect to sanctions. On, <clears throat> on, the, on, the, on the US side, sanctions are a way to uh, force a country to adopt policies which are not their own. Uh, but uh, uh, in the case of China, uh, sanctions are very difficult to implement because if they reciprocate sanctions on US companies in China, this would go against Chinese interest of keeping the normalcy of the relations and of uh, uh, showing to these companies that China is prepared to uh, continue its process of economic integration with the United States, which is a condition for uh, China to continue in its uh, positive uh, economic uh, track and its economic prosperity. So it's very interesting that uh, if at the beginning, uh, sanctions by the US were reciprocated by China, in a, in a proportion in a proportional way but more recently china is much more prudent because if trump succeeds in his intent to decouple the two economies this will be harmful for uh, chinese companies but it will also be harmful to american companies take the case of uh, uh, many, many uh, Chinese companies like Apple. Apple produces 2 million uh, iPhones in China from 1,500 suppliers. Would that be possible to, to, to Apple to cut this integration with uh, uh, Chinese suppliers? But uh, uh, from the side of China, there is a, a, a ref constraint which because uh, going in the direction of reciprocal sanctions is contrary to its interests. I, I agree with you that uh, if uh, a chi China has not reciprocated sanctions in kind, on the other hand, it has taken some strategic measures. And these strategic measures have to do more with uh, the continuity of China Chinese expansion in the world rather than uh, with the US-China uh, relations. Take the example of Hong Kong. Hong Kong, I think it was a deliberate uh, uh, measure taken by China, the new security law, because if this had not happened, perhaps China would lose uh, the relations with Hong Kong. The same thing applies to Iran. It's true that China lost India. But on the other hand, it is uh, trying to conserve uh, its uh, expansion in its alliances around the world. With Russia, for instance, the, the agreement on the use of renminbi for the reserves of uh, Russia. So I, this leads me to the second point of your presentation, which I think is the, the most important one. What's going to happen after the elections? Will Trump be willing to accommodate or will he dub, double down? Kissinger, some time ago, I had a few discussions with him on implications of China, US relationships for Brazil. And uh, he said something which I think is, is important. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, the relationship between the United States and China will shape the new world order, either in the direction of cooperation or in the direction of confrontation, with the difference that if both, both countries resort to confrontation, you will have a disaster without precedent in the history of mankind. So if cooperation is the only way, and there are good reasons for that, and there are possibilities for that, as you mentioned. The point is that uh, if this tension 
between the United States continues. I don't think we are going to a confrontation, but there may be an accident and the accident may escalate. Now, in case Biden wins, I think that the, 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 the period of Obama and Obama foreign policies will be kept in mind. But will the possibilities be there for, a, for more emphasis towards cooperation? Will Biden uh, uh, resort to multilateralism? I think it, Biden will, will. But will it be prepared? Will he be prepared to give up sanctions? Because you cannot accommodate sanctions with multilateralism. Mm -hmm. And if he gives up sanctions, will be he able to uh, continue this uh, containment? Because I think I agree with you to see this is not the good example. I think the good example is George Cannon, although we are not in mm -hmm. a Cold War. But that uh, we'll be able to uh, put pressure on, 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 on China in areas that perhaps China would deserve. So I think that the, unfortunately, the, 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 the new government, be it uh, a government by Trump or by Biden, will uh, have many difficulties in changing the track which may lead both countries to mm -hmm. a, a continuation of confrontation and uh, with the situation of tension. I also, I don't want to, to go much further, but my, 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 my first question was, is, is the American society prepared to accept China as a peer? This, this is, let's say, a kind of uh, uh, thinking that takes some of Thucydides' uh, considerations that uh, the, 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 the confrontation between two hegemonic partners, countries may lead to war. The second, the, the second point is, uh, will Biden be able to change, be it for uh, the reason of popular support for uh, confronting China, or be it because uh, uh, multilateralism implies the, 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 the giving up sanctions. And the third point, I think, is Latin America and mainly Brazil. I think uh, uh, the, 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 this... Uh, uh, tension, rivalry, confrontation between China and the United States is very bad for Latin America because we may be confronted and la that, that's where Kissinger continued his words and said confrontation would face all other countries to take their sides. This is a, a scenario we would like very much to avoid because we are, of course, friends of the United States. We are part of the same family. But we have very concrete uh, economic interests of China. And we see no reason why we should take one side. We should take the side of our interests. And the, the confrontation between the U.S. And, and, and China is very divisive in Latin America. We are not at a good moment. The forces of uh, uh, division seem to prevail in Latin America. Mercosur is weak. The convergence between Mercosur and the Alliance for the Pacific, I think, have been abandoned almost. And all this process of convergence, which existed between Mercosur and Alliance for the Pacific, and politically around the Club of Lima, may be harmed. And I think this is not good for us. Uh, I think uh, uh, there's a point which is not positive for Latin America, and I don't even think it's positive for the United States, is towards the elections at IDB. I have nothing against Mauricio Caroni, but this is a very bad signal for the region because uh, the, the president of IDB is more than the uh, uh, manager of economic loans to Latin America. He used to be the representative, the vice of Latin America in the United States. And that this was, this uh, change is not an important. It was a good tradition that might have been uh, respected. But uh, uh, I think that uh, for Brazil, it's not only the political aspects, as I mentioned, 
this this confrontation reduces our space for autonomous foreign policy and uh, and that puts us in a difficult political situation but it's also economic because we cannot afford to lose important partners either one or the other or any other country so i think that um, i try to uh, emphasize some points i i fully agree with the the main uh, grounds the main thrust of your presentation and I think that uh, some questions remain and I think that we will have uh, to try to avoid division uh, in Latin America increasing and mainly this bad dilemma to prevail. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sergio, for those, those comments and, and your questions. Uh, I'll answer uh, the, the questions briefly, and then we can turn to the, the questions coming from the, the rest of the participants. Um, you know, are the American people prepared to uh, accept a a peer uh, or China as a peer? Um, you know, the American people are realists. Um, you know, they always have been, uh, and uh, they recognize that that the world uh, develops. Uh, along pathways that are defined by many um, factors that are beyond the control of the United States. Uh, and, and so I, I don't think it's a question of whether or not they're willing to. I think, I think it's really a question of they, they will accept reality as it presents itself. Uh, and if the reality is of China as a peer, it will be accepted as a peer, um, at least economically. I think it's still a long way from being a peer militarily, um, but but, or, or culturally, uh, but, but certainly um, uh, economically and in terms of, of, of trade and investment. Uh, I think the fact that the debate in the United States right now is about great power competition underscores that even in uh, those parts of the American body politic that are not friendly to China, there's a recognition uh, that China has become a, a great power and therefore has to be dealt with uh, as such. So I, th I think in that regard, we're okay. Um, you know, in, in terms of what comes next, uh, depending on our elections, uh, first of all, with the Trump administration, there has been a division within the administration about how to address China. There has been a group of people in, in uh, the administration who view Chinese behavior as predatory and dangerous but changeable over time, uh, or it can be influenced over time, and therefore uh, want to use um, the hard punitive tools that we have at our disposal to send clear messages to the, to the Chinese, but who recognize and understand the importance of both economies to each other uh, and do not want to do lasting damage or harm uh, to our economic well being or to China's economic well being. There are, however, others in the administration who believe that China is an implacable foe and that the only uh, salvation for us is to decouple uh, and to wound China economically and technologically in a way that it will not be able to recover quickly. Um, my own view is that that's madness. Uh, my, my own view is that uh, the world economy and the, the, the level of globalization we have reached uh, does not allow us to decouple. We are now so marbled, we are so connected to each other in so many different ways that we are gonna have to find a way to get along. And we're gonna have to find a way to, um, to ensure that whatever differences we have and however strenuously we might wrestle with each other, that at the end of the day, we recognize that China's success is America's success and America's success is China's success. And, and finding that, that point uh, is really going to be the political challenge and it's going to be the, 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 the diplomatic challenge. Thank you, Tom. And now we come to the questions from the audience and the Claudia has already um, sent me a first one and which is a key one. Uh, what would the, be the implications of uh, 5G warfare 
uh, between the US and China for Brazil. How to accommodate US and China in this difficult question? Yeah. No, that, that is a difficult question and I'm grateful for it uh, because in many ways, uh, it's going to define uh, how, in this instance, Brazil relates to China and the United States. Uh, I understand and recognize that Huawei has a significant presence uh, in Brazil um, and uh, is prepared to play a very important role in the construction of 5G infrastructure. Uh, and, uh, but the United States has, has very real concerns uh, about Huawei and about the, the role of a, of a company like Huawei uh, in, in building uh, out uh, that infrastructure. And uh, again, far be it for me to offer advice, but I, I do think that, that this will be a concern independent of who wins the elections in the United States in November. Uh, I, I think it is uh, built uh, on the importance of 5G, on the importance of information infrastructure, uh, and, and the importance of of ensuring uh, that that uh, infrastructure be trustworthy, um, especially if uh, information related to the United States and related to the security of the United States is, is being moved uh, uh, across that, that information spectrum. Um, that said, um, uh, I believe there are, are tools that can be used to diminish uh, the, um, uh, the vulnerabilities uh, and the danger presented uh, by having a, an untrustworthy partner uh, in this regard, um, or at least one that is viewed in an untrustworthy fashion by the United States. And, and what uh, the United States and Brazil have to do is, is have a, a pretty frank conversation um, about what, what we can live with and what we can't live with. And then Brazil will have to make a decision recognizing that it has development um, goals and needs where um, this 5G infrastructure is going to play a very important role. Thank you. I think there's, there's a new question that to, I think to some extent, a large extent has already been touched upon. I don't know whether you would like to add some new uh, arguments is how the US and China rivalry will shape the 21st century. You know, um, it, first of all, it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great question, and, and we could talk about this all day. Um, but you mentioned earlier that Henry Kissinger had said that should the United States and China decide to enter into some kind of global confrontation, that nobody will be safe, that everyone will have to choose a side. I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, you know, the, the world is no longer the world of the immediate post-war and um, the difference we're dealing with here are differences of, of power and purpose. They're not necessarily ideological differences, although we in the Chinese view the world differently and understand governance differently. Um, uh, our purpose is not to overwhelm and replace each other, uh, you know, as it was in our struggle with, with the Soviet Union. And during the Cold War, there was almost a kind of magnetic process that ordered the world in which people were pushed to one side or, or the other. I think with China, it will be a bit different. And in fact, I think that there are more than a few countries in the world preparing for um, that potential situation and trying to make absolutely certain that they're not, not captured or defined by it. And for instance, if you look at a lot of the thinking that's being done in the um, European Union and within the European Commission right now, especially some of their, their forward-looking pieces, uh, they're very intent on not getting caught in this dynamic and not being made to kind of bow to one or the other, to the United States or to China. And it's very interesting, for instance, in the case of Germany, if you watch how it has um, worked with Russia, especially on energy issues, and especially on Nord Stream 2, which is a, an energy pipeline that is being built out of Russia uh, through the Baltics and down into Germany. Um, this is something that the United States has opposed uh, and, is, and has been very clear to the Germans and to the countries through which the pipeline passes uh, that this pipeline will be bad because it will create a dependency 
uh, for Europe on Russian oil and gas. But one of the reasons the Europeans are doing this is because they want to keep Russia close because they understand that in a, a world that divides between the United States and China, that Russia is gonna become a very important player again. And it's gonna have a role similar to what it had in the late 19th century and early 20th century, when it was Europe's most Im important power in terms of its ability never to be defeated uh, and always to provide troops uh, and one to which everyone was trying to form an alliance. Um, and it's odd to think in the 21st century that European politicians are thinking back into the 19th century about how to manage their, their global relations. Um, but I, I think that, that what Europe would do in a, cold, a new Cold War environment would then send a very strong signal to other uh, parts of the world that, hey, we don't have to play this game. We can find a way to, to not get caught in this. So, um, uh, but in the process of doing this, um, what worries me uh, is that if you look at um, what is happening technologically and scientifically in terms of advancements in life sciences, uh, in informatics, in artificial intelligence, and in many other aspects of, uh, or areas of, of human investigation and endeavor, we really are on the cusp of dramatic and major changes in the world that are going to fundamentally improve the quality of life for many people and are going to allow uh, many countries in the world to address issues of poverty, inequality, and social exclusion and enhance the ability of individuals to live productive lives that reflect um, their own potential as, as individuals. And we need to be uh, in a position diplomatically and politically, where we are fostering and promoting this. And therefore, we need to be looking for ways to do everything possible to preserve peace uh, and to promote this kind of prosperity. And I think in many ways, this is the challenge that faces the United States and China. And on this, I believe we will both be judged, not only by our contemporaries, but also by our posterity, by history which is, did we find a way to work together to resolve our differences, or at least to keep them at a manageable level of discord so that the world can progress and progress can continue in a way that allows the entire globe to benefit? Or are we so concerned about our individual positioning that we actually set the, um, uh, the globe aflame uh, and create problems that are gonna seriously hinder uh, the development of, of humanity at an important moment. Um, may I comment to something? Do you have uh, somewhere this kind of approach written? Because it's very important for us to consider that there are some other countries which are also trying to avoid this dilemma and being put into a corner. And I think what you said about Europe is a good example of that. Uh, there are many, uh, many, many questions. I don't know whether we're going to have time for all of them. One is, when do you think China will be able to come closer to the US in the military field? And another question has to do with uh, US companies in China. Will Trump be able to make these countries leave China? Yeah. No, the, the, both very good, good questions. Um, in regard to military capability, at a global level, it will take quite a while uh, for China to um, uh, be able to match the, the United States, to match the ability of the United States to project power. Uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't need to do that. Uh, what it needs to be able to do is be able to project power in its near neighborhood especially in the South China Sea and in the Indian Ocean. Um, um, and to ensure that, and, and the South Pacific to a certain extent. Um, and what China has been doing in the South China Sea is effectively militarizing uh, the South China Sea in a way that would make it very dangerous for the United States Navy uh, to enter and to engage with, with Chinese forces. Uh, and it seeks to, uh, the, the, the People's Liberation Army, the Chinese military, seeks to um, 
uh, put itself in a position where it can do grievous harm uh, to American uh, forces, especially naval forces uh, uh, in the, the South Pacific, in the South China Sea, um, and um, entering uh, in, into the Indian Ocean. And I think uh, it's very important that both China and the United States find a way to make sure that that kind of conflict um, uh, do, does not happen um, because it could have devastating consequences um, uh, for the, the reputations and well-beings of, 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 of both countries. Um, remind me of the second part of that question. Yes, the second part of that question has to do with um, uh, what, what, what the United States or Trump would be able to I remove see. Chinese uh, American companies from China. Uh, well, I mean, the, 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 the federal government typically does not put itself in a position where it tells companies where they can go and where they cannot go, um, unless the, the countries are completely off limits. Um, uh, there are tools at the president's disposal um, um, from taxation, you know, to, to, to other, other tools, but um, they're not easy to manage. Um, but but I, I do think that um, uh, one of the things you will see and as a result of the pandemic and as a result of the turbulence in the relationship is that some companies themselves will begin to think that China might not be a good place to source their materials from and that they need to move their supply chains uh, to parts of the world that uh, are, um, are less subject uh, to, to this kind of, of conflict or confrontation, whether that be in South, South, Southeast Asia or Indonesia, whether it's Australia, whether it's Latin America. Uh, I, I think that is a, a, a real possibility that companies on their own will begin to re-examine uh, their, their presence in China. And uh, I would uh, make a, a final question, which has to do with soft power and China position in clean energy. Yeah. Is that something which we might expect uh, to uh, China really commit itself? Oh, I think so. I mean, it's ironic to a certain extent because China is the world's greatest emitter uh, of of greenhouse gases um, and has a, a pretty horrific environmental record, uh, at least you know during its industrialization. But at the same time, it has become a, a real leader in some uh, environmental technologies, and and this is to be promoted. This is good. Um, you know, we want a, a, a China that is diversifying its its energy portfolio, that is looking for ways to to address environmental degradation. Uh, and and I, I think that that one would hope that, that this is an area in which the United States and, and China might be able to find uh, important cooperation. And in a, in, in a country like Brazil could play a very important role in that, given what Brazil has done on environmental issues, um, and, and especially in regard uh, you know, to um, non-fossil fuel um, energy sources. Master Shannon, thank you very much for your presence with us, for the very thoughtful remarks you have made. And I think uh, there are many issues in which uh, your remarks enlighten our policies or our goals. And I'll turn to Ambassador Castro Neves now to make the closing of this very rich conversation. Luiz Augusto. Ambassador Castro Neves. It's your time. Thank you very much, Sergio. And I, it is I who thank both of you for your most valuable contribution to our understanding of one of the leading problems of today's international relations, the relationship between the United States of America and the People's Republic of China. And of course, its possible impacts on Brazil. Uh, it's, uh, it's indeed uh, one issue that will have to be addressed by 
uh, foreign policy people in Brazil. Uh, as I saw from the questions that were presented, most of them had to do with 5G and what will happen if Brazil opts for one solution or for the other solution, what would be possible retaliation from one country or another. That remains to be seen. But anyway, it was a, Tom Shannon shed an, uh, an enormous amount of light in what will have, what, what may happen uh, uh, regarding one path or another to be taken by both US and China. And uh, I would also remember, I think uh, Tom Shannon mentioned uh, what international relations is about. And I remember in the memorials of Anatoly Dobrivin, he said that international re relations would be about reaching to a fruitful compromise of interests. And that was his perception of that. Of course, the US, the USSR failed and uh, we are in another world. And uh, also the questions of decoupling are very important too. I, th I do believe, as uh, Master Shannon, that in a globalized world, which it would be impossible to deglobalize, maybe we may shift some global value chains to have another format, another uh, meaning, another limit, uh, some limitations. But as a matter of fact, we are all in a way or another coupled to the rest of the world. And uh, we have perhaps, what the path will be, we don't know. I don't know, but we have perhaps to, 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 to reach the fruitful compromise of uh, interest that Anatoly de Bridgen once said. Sa saying that, I want again to, to thank Tom Channel for his uh, very, uh, uh, presentation. It was an honor for me personally, an honor for the Brazil-China Business Council, and also for uh, to Sergio Marao, a former chairman of the Brazil-China uh, Business Council. Finally, thank uh, once again the Itaú BBA for its sponsorship. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you very much. I wish you all the very best. Thank you.